Hi everyone, my name is Aaron Paul Orsini and I am the author of Autism on Acid, How LSD Helped Me Understand, Navigate, Alter, and Appreciate My Autistic Perceptions. I'm also one of the co-founders of the Autistic Psychedelic Community, an online affinity group that's dedicated to peer support, advocacy, and education at the intersection of psychedelics and neurodivergence. And in the next couple of minutes here I'm going to try to give you a rundown of everything that has come to the formation of the autistic psychedelic community and everything that informs uh, the rationale for the release of our soon to be published anthology entitled the autistic psychedelic which will feature the words of more than 40 neurodivergent individuals expressing and explaining how psychedelics have been instrumental in their personal growth, healing, transformation, and self-understanding. So before we get underway with the Autistic Psychedelic Community Project, I'd like to color in how we got here by beginning with my own story. And what I'm about to show you here is a sample of a soon-to-be-released short film it was uh, put together by uh, an MFA student uh, named Kaylin LaMancha out of the UK. And this particular clip comes from uh, my story, Autism on Acid. And to contextualize what you're about to watch, this is from the self-titled second chapter of that book, in which I undergo my first experience with my surgic acid diethylamide. And to further contextualize this cl short clip, this exact moment is right after a series of events in my life in which I had left uh, a job, I had ended a relationship recently as well, and I was also dealing with the grief of a friend who was killed by a drunk driver. Uh, so there was a great deal of trauma that I was actively running away from at the point, uh, that I came across LSD. So that's the context there, and I'll play that clip for you. And from there, I think you'll gain an understanding of the weight and the gravity and the importance of the work that I've continued to do and have been so grateful to found have found collaborators as I continue to do this work. So here we go. So I carried on, barely living, but at least living. And on one of the darkest hours of the darkest days, I decided that rather than ending my life, I would instead put an end to the life I'd built. And I did what a lot of anxious and confused people do when they're pushed to the limit. I ran away. I went into retreat. I didn't tell very many people, other than the few connections I'd barely managed to maintain in spite of my isolated state, but I retreated. I sold all my stuff, I packed a bag, I bought a train ticket, and I headed west to see if there was something, anything, that might be worth living for. And a few days into my travels, I was presented with the option to try LSD. And being at a point in my life where I felt very much out of options, I took it, and I sat in the forest, waiting to experience one more failed attempt at escaping the waking hell of existence, when suddenly... Whew, holy shit. It was connection. Such connection. I felt in so many ways, I felt it. And with so many parts of my processing centers woven together for the very first time, so many realizations seemed to come crashing in all at once. In the initial hours of the experience, as the LSD began to take effect, I felt more and more connected with the trees and the breeze and the sunlight that surrounded me. I experienced a deep moment of engagement, yeah. A moment of connection with nature, the thoughts of my parents, my family, my friends, and this whole human family and this broader web of life. And I 
know it sounds so cliche, but I was just awash in this sense of deep, deep love for so many aspects of my life. And this single session of LSD had not only washed away this background hum of suicidal ideation, amazingly, befuddlingly, wow, what the fuck? I not only didn't feel like killing myself, I felt very much like living because I felt very much alive and connected. And feeling connected meant I cared about who and what I was and what I was connected to. And I felt this sense of connection so deeply. And it wasn't a hallucination. It was a realization. An intuitive sense that my well-being was directly connected to the health and the well-being of the natural environment within which I resided. Expounding on this further, I would say that during those initial hours of that first LSD experience, I felt a sense of care for myself, for others, for the world. I cared about it, all of it, and I felt like the world of human beings cared about me. And it's wonderful, really, to feel like caring, to feel cared for as well, it's so beautiful, really, to feel like I've been nurtured by nature, to feel like it's in my nature to nurture, but I'm starting to sound like someone who took a lot of acid, so let me step back out of the clouds of love for just a second and talk about something that some of us might not be as experienced with, and that's the subjective experience of taking LSD as an autistic adult. So that was that first experience or the first part of that experience and shortly after that peak of that first LSD experience in the book Autism on Acid I wrote this um, after walking out of that forest and encountering another indiv individual I wrote when the person opposite me spoke When the person opposite me spoke, I felt the weight of their words. I sensed their state of mind. I grasped the context of what was unfolding. I could feel their feelings. I could feel my own feelings. And I could feel what it was like to feel differently about my feelings. As our feelings changed in real time. <laughs> and, uh, that's it. <laughs> I mean, that's not it. That, for me, that was, that was the beginning of, of the rest of my life. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be talking about a bunch of science soon. Um, but I bring this to light because I think it gets lost sometimes when we just read just the science, just, just the numbers of it all. It doesn't, it doesn't really translate. Um, and so, that's why, I, that's why I wrote this book. That's why I did all this to to let people know that there that there are alternate ways um, of bringing about states that some people might not think are accessible uh, for them. Um, and we'll get into it uh, more. But I occupy a unique position because. The average researcher cannot acknowledge their substance use. And I just happen to not necessarily be a researcher. I'm a citizen scientist. I've done my own searches for all this information. And my hope is that what I'm about to present to you um, will, in the same way it has for me, taken something from, oh, wow, to, oh, how? <laughs> <laughs> and why and 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 what can we do so that's that's the rest of the presentation and that's really the rest of my life and my work and the work that we're doing with the APC is gathering enough perspectives so we can get closer and closer to understanding the nature of these experiences 
how we can make these experiences more safe and more accessible and everything. So with that, I'm going to try to transition um, and we're going to go into some of the informational slides. Um, these slides are going to include a combination of quotes from myself and other um, autistic psychedelic community members. Um, the names featured uh, throughout uh, have been an anonymized uh, in, the, in, pre in preservation of uh, these individuals. Given the current legal landscape, we still have to be sensitive about these things. Um, but I thank them. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I thank them with, uh, with everything I have um, because, <laughs> yeah, that's whatever. I, again, we're going to get to the research. <laughs> We'll get there. All right. So the timeline of what happened, uh, that clip that I just showed was uh, when I was 27 years of age. I'm now almost 34 years of age. So nearly seven years ago was that first experience. I sat with that information uh, and wrote about it, researched about it. And finally, in September of 2019, I gave my first public keynote speech. Uh, for the AWARE project. It's a Southern California-based uh, advocacy uh, organization. Um, and I gave that keynote speech, presented my book, and that was the beginning. From there forward, my name was just kind of out there as like uh, autistic and uh, user of Schedule 1 drugs and all these things. Um, but I wouldn't have taken those risks on if it... It didn't mean everything. So uh, from there, in January of 2020, um, I did my first public interview uh, on the podcast for Psychedelics Today. Talked more in depth about that same first LSD experience and some of the ways that I had processed it and integrated it. And as time went on between January 2020 and March of 2020, I began to receive an increasing abundance of emails from individuals who had come across that AWARE project video or that Psychedelics Today interview, and our emails <laughs> began sounding very similar. Um, and what was once me Googling to the end of the internet to try to find uh, other people uh, was suddenly not so. Suddenly there was you know, an email every few days, weeks, and then it became a couple emails on a given day. So in March of 2020, we had the first meeting of the autistic psychedelic community, and we just opened a Zoom and asked, like, hey, guys that have emailed me, do you guys want to get together, talk about this, or other people? Do you guys want to also take part in this? And we started to talk about things, and we started to discover a lot of trends, not only within our own lives as autistic individuals or autistic adults, moreover, which is another underrepresented group of the whole autism story, but also in our psychedelic experiences, of course, there's still diversity. We all have distinct bodies, personalities, everything. Um, but we found some like kind of correlative patterns as far as like how certain aspects of these tools could be intelligently applied for profound functional improvement. Um, and how they also illuminated within us how in a lot of ways we were already quite functional and we were placed in contexts or circumstances that were creating a sense of dysfunction and if we made that change of context or circumstance that we were finding also improvements so just by coming together as a as a community we really started to, to learn together um some time went on and I, I reached out to uh, dr katrin proller she's a, a swiss neuroscientist at uh, studied uh, psychedelics such as psilocybin and LSD in the context of social cognition and she agreed to uh, come and talk with us um, we did like an interview with her it was an honor to speak with her and uh, a short time uh, after that <clears throat> uh, then we decided well let's do some things and so <laughs> uh, we put out our first survey uh, that was in July of 2020, and we hosted that through AutisticPsychedelic.com. Uh, it was a really basic survey. It was like 
how were you before? How, what was it like during? What about after? Anything to add to that? It was a super basic survey. Um, we started to get a preliminary kind of entries coming through, and we shared uh, some of those quotes in an October 2020 interview with the plantmedicine.org podcast. That's a podcast that's hosted by Dr. Lynn Marie Mikowski of the Plant Medicine uh, Association and also the, of the Psychedelic Medicine Association. Uh, and I shared some of those quotes, and that was so empowering to be able to bring more voices to not only validate my own story, but to also color in the vast diversity of experiences, outcomes, predispositions. As the saying goes in autistic communities, if you meet one autistic, you've met one autistic. Um, and we constantly find that to be the case. Like we're unified by our uniqueness and, uh, and fortified by the sense of acceptance for that uniqueness, just the same. Um, but <laughs> that happened. We shared those first results. And with each of these small steps out into public and into the media, we started to get more like feedback from other people who are coming across this work and who are like, oh, I didn't know there was a place where people were talking about that. Like, I have something to say about that. I have something to say about that. Um, and so then we got to this place where we just kept meeting. So again, we're coming up soon on the one year anniversary. So that's one year of weekly Sunday, 90 minute, two hour ish meetings every week. Um, and we're also going to be putting out that book around the same time. And that's just one year of pe people getting together, some of which are in like the mental health sciences, some of which are just simply experts in their own lives. But that's a year of people just meeting over Zoom once a week. And many of those people come and go and people get shuffled about. So like, We've, we, I personally uh, feel we've made a good deal of progress in progressing our self-understandings and our hope is to share those understandings through this anthology of, of advocacy writing uh, and the essays and the survey responses uh, because, again, uh, we'll, we'll dive into some of the research components, but that research only becomes worth doing when we become aware of why. Um, and uh, and we like this this group of people and the people we're yet to meet like they're the reason why um, they're the reason why uh, we research this stuff. So to date, we've done uh, like I said, uh, we're going on more than fifty peer support group meetings that we've done. More than five hundred members have attended one or more meetings. Um, and uh, there's roughly uh, 50 or so uh, essays that we're going to be presenting uh, in that in that book uh, and personal reflections, surveys, responses, things like that. So that's just when I say things throughout this presentation, it's coming through uh, it's coming through the distinct honor of being able to speak on behalf of these individuals um, and to more accurately bring their words to light. Um, there's one thing I want to say before we dive into the rest of this, and that's that, and, and I know this is somewhat redundant, but it's an honor to speak on behalf of these individuals. I wish that they could similarly be here and, uh, not have to have like a, a fear of the stigma, uh, or consequence that might come about for talking about these things, uh, because these people are wonderful people. Um, but with that said, I don't want to say that I myself represent them. My story is my story. Their stories are theirs, and that's the idea behind the anthology, allowing these individuals to be as, as they are. So, all right. So that's the, that's the, uh, that's the, that's the feelings part of this. So now we'll go to the some uh, some statistics statistics and definitions that I feel are also important. 
And this is where, to me, this is where it all really comes together because this is a unique circumstance where I feel the work that I've been doing is working backwards of being like, well, I know what happens, but why though? And how? Um, like, I, I know what happens within myself, but why or how and what medical explanations can there be? And that's why we're gathered to talk about these things. So, firstly, there is a statistic from the latest CDC numbers that states that one in every 45 people in the United States is autistic. These are the most recent estimates. These estimates have been going up year over year. A lot of that has to do with the diagnostic tools, the availability of these diagnostic tools and other criteria that I'll allow other medical professionals to explain much better than I. Uh, but either way, for context, it's just bearing in mind that when we're talking about autistics, we're talking about one person in every one to two classrooms uh, is who we're talking about um, as far as some of these aspects of experience. Now again, I want to emphasize throughout that any one of these individuals is still unique and any one of these experiences is still unique. Um, but just to start off, one in 45 people is autistic. Another uh, number coming off of that CDC statistic was therefore that roughly five and a half million uh, adult autistics uh, exist in the United States as well. Um, again, this is just USA numbers, but just to give you a, a sense of that, um, you know, that's the size of a significant, uh, some of the most major metropolitan areas just being a full population of uh, this particular neurotype. Extrapolated out using WHO numbers, uh, the estimates are somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 million uh, autistic individuals. Uh, this number is extrapolated off of a statistic that is not that original 1 in 45 number I just mentioned. That's a U.S.-based statistic. This statistic is derived from a higher uh, or rather a lower percentage assumed worldwide, again, based on not only diagnostic availabilities, but also cultural perceptions that inform these diagnostics. Again, I'll save that for the other medical professionals to dive into. But I bring those statistics and these definitions because I think that they're important. I don't always know exactly who is listening in, and if you're a medical professional, great. Maybe this is just review, or maybe this is whatever. And if you're a, a, a lay person or an autistic or a caretaker, maybe this is completely new. Either way, I think it's good to establish a clear language set so that we are working from some of the same kind of understandings. So what is autism? So this is a definition that was pulled by an autistic PhD scholar, Dr. Nick Walker. Um, and this was a, a, a definition that was developed uh, with the intention of developing a non-pathologizing definition of autism that would uh, speak from the neurodiversity paradigm. And we'll get into that uh, in a short minute, but I'll read it aloud here. It's a lot of information to take in, but I think it's helpful to introduce this because it's a question that I'm asked so frequently, and it's a question that we're all still asking. And what I like about this answer is that it leaves room for the still yet unknown aspects and what we're still trying to understand. Uh, this definition is available in multiple languages at the link. Um, uh, and if you would like to learn even more, uh, more of uh, Dr. Walker's work is uh, available through that same uh, site as well. Lots of definitions related to neurodiversity. But this definition states, autism is a genetically based human neurological variant, the complex set of interrelated characteristics that distinguish autistic neurology from non-autistic neurology is not yet fully understood, but current evidence indicates that the central distinction is that autistic brains are characterized by particularly high levels of synaptic connectivity and responsiveness. This tends to make the autistic individual's subjective experience more intense and chaotic than that of non-autistic individuals. So again, I understand that this is a lot of information to take in now, uh, but again, I invite you to dive deeper into those definitions and to learn more as well. So neurodiversity, it's mentioned previous, and I, I, I like the definition that uh, Dr. Lawrence Fung has put together uh, out of Stanford. 
uh, stating very simply that neurodiversity is a concept that regards individuals with differences in brain functions and behavioral traits as part of normal variation in the human population. I also like to lean on the simple kind of phrasing of neurodiversity is similar to biodiversity in that it's somewhat implicit if we consider multiple forms of life. Uh, one moment, there are some uh, sirens in the back. So as I was saying, one way of looking at neurodiversity is to parallel it to biodiversity, the idea that there are multiple types of life forms and intelligences, similar diversity, neuro, uh, diversity of brains and brain functions. Very simple. But applied, it is also looking into how we can utilize things such as accommodation or environmental changes in order to support the uniqueness of those neurodiverse needs of given individuals. So something to keep in mind there. Neurodivergent is a term you've already probably heard me use throughout this presentation, but uh, neurodivergent refers to a brain that functions in ways that diverge significantly from the dominant societal standards of normal. This again is coming from Dr. Walker's work. Um, but so in other words, a group of individuals uh, who are not adhering to the dominant societal standards or who may fall outside of like the mean of uh, normal ranges in medical uh, standards uh, similarly. So with that in mind, uh, neurotypical refers to a brain having a style of neurocognitive functioning that falls within the dominant societal standards of normal. Uh, again, definition coming from Dr. Walker's work. And neurodiverse refers to a group of people in which one or more members of the group differ substantially uh, from other members in terms of their neurocognitive functioning. And if you look at these three uh, brains here, uh, and if we assume brain on the left is autistic, brain in center, neurotypical, brain on right, uh, ADHD, or something like this, if we are to look at that group, that group is neurodiverse. But what's interesting is that, obviously, these are cartoon representations of brains. Um, but similarly, if you chose any one of these three brains here, and they were existing inside of multiple persons, um, then even something like three people with ADHD would be considered neurodiverse, just as three people who are considered neurotypical would also be neurodiverse, because brains are diverse. <laughs> I know, I know. It, it's it's very it, deceptively simple. Um, and when we start to dive into how these things impact us, we start to see why it is important to recognize unique needs and the benefit that that carries um, for everyone, those inside and outside of the quote-unquote norm. Uh, they can all benefit. And that's ultimately the path that neurodiversity is on right now. So now that we've packed our bags, now that we know all about neurodiversity and statistics and populations and all those things, and now that you know enough about myself and this organization, now we're diving into the meat of this presentation, and that's why might psychedelics matter to autistics? It's a curious question. Like, <laughs> It's a question that most people ask when they hear our name. Why? Why autistic psychedelic? Why autism on it? Why any of this? Uh, hopefully that initial kind of preview of my story makes a little bit of sense, but we still haven't even gotten to the heart of the matter. So my hope here is to really uh, make you guys feel as though you really have a sense for, you know, why this work is ongoing and why I'm, I'm dedicating my life to it um, and why others have also been so generous with their time to help um, create uh, a better foundation for, for growth uh, into these understandings. So there's four things that I'm going to talk about. The first is going to be around the subject and theme of acceptance. I'll then talk about alexithymia, which is a subclinical condition associated strongly with ASD. And then we'll also talk about depression and connection. Now, these are just four general themes. I feel that they are, you know, a good 
jumping off point, but there's so much more I could say. But luckily, there's an entire book of other people saying things, so I'll leave it for that. So, number one, acceptance. Let's talk about acceptance. So this is a quote uh, from the book. Again, all these uh, names have been uh, intentionally uh, anonymized, anonymized uh, made anonymous for the purpose of this book. Um, but in this uh, particular quote, uh, the quote is, but then a psychedelic experience eroded my negative self-perceptions and exercised those self-perceptions. I saw myself, my qualities, and my character. And for the first time, I could appreciate who I was, who I've been, and who I am. And that's coming from an individual, uh, age 46, uh, with ASD. Another quote uh, related to acceptance comes from Walter, age 41, diagnosed with ASD, ADHD, who said, During the ayahuasca experience, I received the knowledge that life is magical, mysterious, and wonderful, that judging myself for my social awkwardness was just cruel and unhelpful, and that I didn't need to do that anymore. I also received the realization that nothing was really wrong with me, and that I can simply accept and love who I am. So there's that as well. And again, I, there's so much I could say, but I try to let these quotes just kind of speak so that's the acceptance piece and that generally again we're looking at a subpopulation and we're also talking about neurodiversity so some of these things some of you in the audience might be saying wait like isn't acceptance that's like people do psychedelics not just autistic like anyone can love themselves and like you're right person in the audience they can <laughs> Um, but uh, these particular stories are just mentioned um, very importantly because there's uh, somewhat of a debate as to whether or not autistics uh, should be included in certain kinds of psychedelic therapy approaches. And so we present those previous case examples as a means of being like, these persons are autistic. They received a, a perceived benefit of an increase in self-acceptance. We feel that that is worth sharing. So yeah. So point number two, alexithymia. This one hits really close to my own story uh, and that initial quote that I had mentioned about kind of coming into an awareness of feeling the the sort of kinesthetic, like feeling the deep feeling states of what I was experiencing as opposed to normal where I'm kind of floating through space. Um, but don't worry, there's lots of information ahead and I will explain this term that maybe some of you have never heard. So alexithymia is a cluster of cognitive traits, including difficulty identifying and or describing feelings, as I more or less just previously stated. But it's very important to point out that it presently is considered a cluster of cognitive traits. So it's subclinical. So you can still take like an alexithymia questionnaire. You can get an alexithymia score on that questionnaire. Um, however, it's not a full clinical uh, condition in its own right. It's being looked at uh, in the case of autism spectrum and other conditions. Uh, but just to keep it simple, alexithymia, difficulty identifying and or describing feelings. So if you look at some quotes related, again, this is another quote from uh, Walter, age 41, with ASD, ADHD, who said, as someone who has struggled with alexithymia my whole life, Psychedelics have really helped me build a better relationship with my own emotions. I may not always have direct access to them, but my understanding of my emotions is now at a place where I can more easily understand them. So, again, just going to kind of let these quotes speak for themselves here. But, going back to alexithymia, again, it literally translates from the Greek root words meaning no words for emotions so it's important to draw that distinction that this is a, a process of having a difficulty arriving to the awareness of that emotion the awareness of that feeling state um, identifying it labeling it and therefore making an informed decision based upon that um, and 
we'll get into this in some more detail, but I think you're starting to get a sense of what we're talking about here. So people with alexithymia may demonstrate de deficiencies in emotional awareness and communication and show little insight into their feelings, symptoms, and motivation. So again, just bringing it forward with this notion that this is a, con a subclinical condition that's out there. We've seen a number of reports from autistics who are speaking about this, about this particular subclinical condition being improved either during or following some of their sessions. And I, I admit I have a bias in this, but I tend to think this is fairly significant and worth pointing out. And I think you'll maybe feel the same soon. So... Some statistics for alexithymia are that it's estimated, again, um, according to a recent uh, neurological review on alexithymia, there was an estimated 10% uh, of all humans experience alexithymia. So that's 780 million people worldwide are estimated to encounter this difficulty. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with uh, it being uh, somewhat emergent from a large pool of suspected points of origin, uh, anything from trauma to genetic variations to so many things. So if that's the case, that's a lot of people who might not know how they feel or what they need to do to feel differently. Um, so that's maybe significant. But what's really significant to me is that 50% of autistic individuals are estimated to experience alexithymia and up to 70% in some studies. <laughs> so what I've learned since my initial book is that a lot of the issues I was addressing were really these aspects of alexithymia, these aspects of having a difficulty describing or becoming aware, because even in that initial story that I shared with you all, I might have been in a depressive state, but I was not necessarily able to discern one sort of moment over the next of where I was. I could experience what I perceived to be like a joyful, or like I could be more active, I could be more sleepy, these kinds of things. But there's a difficulty in really having that like exactitude of like, what is that? Am I mad? Am I hungry? I don't know. There's like that confusion. That's my own version of it anyway. And You'll see some more case examples as we go. So one thing that's really important to point out is that it's still not exactly clear based on up till now research whether alexithymia or ASD are necessarily like emergent in any way from one another or what the sort of relationship is between the two. But these statistics, as far as populations go, are fairly reliable based on this research. So... With that in mind, it's just important to point out for the other half of autistics who don't experience alexithymia, it's really important to course correct that cultural myth that those individuals might lack some form of like empathy or something like this. And it's also similarly important to highlight that that empathy might not be lacking in a sort of like biological sense or a, a, a sort of permanent sense. It's like a state dependent uh, or perhaps like trauma uh, like related or in, in my case like a, a drug induced improvement upon that absence of that awareness so when we start to see that these sorts of not only that like our states themselves have fluidity but also our perception of those states has a similar level of fluidity then we start to come into some foundational issues with the way some of this language is architected with such a sort of sense of permanence, uh, assigning a label ongoing that might be state dependent, time dependent, or again, in my case, like dose dependent. I, I don't become like less autistic. I become more able to identify my feeling states, my emotional core, my basic things like, am I hungry? <laughs> So that's important. So I digress. So if we look at all this put together, and this is a Nature article, uh, an article that was published in Nature, rather, in 2021, so it's super recent, 
um, that was showing that alexithymia traits outweighed autism traits in the explanation of depression in adults with autistic. So in other words, dominance analysis revealed the alexithymia factor or difficulties in identifying those feelings as the strongest predictor for depressive symptomology in ASD. So again, if we flash back through everything we just covered, it's like autistics have a high likelihood of experiencing this phenomenon this phenomenon being experienced leads to an increased phenomenon of depression so therefore it might be important and this maps over my life journey and the journey of a lot of others as well Um, and that's why it's so important to bring some of these subjective things out to light so bobby age 29 diagnosed with asd said, I don't believe I lacked empathy before this psychedelic experience because I could always analyze how people felt, but I had never been able to feel it. Suddenly, so many things I'd never understood nor experienced before were now seemingly available to me. I then began to cry hysterically. It was as if I had new eyes, as if a filter system had been turned off. And again, I'll let that just kind of speak for itself. Um, and Elliot, age 38, with Asperger's, uh, stated, Many psychedelic experiences have got me to reconnect with my physical body. People with ASD typically have trouble with this, and I think this is part of the reason why we also get caught up in the ever-solidifying realities we make up with our rich intellectual world. In learning to reconnect physically, I've learned to incorporate healthy environment conditions in my home, and my work, and to incorporate more physical touch with my family and my friends. So that's a quote from Elliot. So now we've covered acceptance and alexithymia, and there's still more. Um, Again, I have a bias towards the alexithymia piece because you can start to see how some of that connects to so many other things. But out of respect for the non-overlapping components and really fleshing out some of these details, I'd like to finish up with this depression piece and the connection piece as well, because I think that they're equally important. Um, And they also have the unique property in this case of, of, again, mapping over a lot of research that's been done in general population studies already. So depression prevalence in autism is estimated to be about 23% of autistic adults that are facing depression at any given time in terms of current rates. That's again coming from that same Nature article from 2021. And estimated that 37% of autistics will experience depression at some point in their lives. So uh, that's again we, we all are fairly familiar with depression, probably much more so than maybe autism or alexithymia, any of these things. Um, part of my rationale for kind of placing this later is maybe <laughs> giving you a lot of information already. This is pretty, this is the easy stuff. We might be running out of energy. Um, but simple stuff, 37% of autistics experience depression at some point in their life. So psychedelics and depression, and there's no shortage of other studies I could direct you to too. Um, this particular study was released uh, last fall uh, out, of, out of Hopkins, and uh, this was in Healthy Normals with Major Depressive Disorder. And this uh, particular trial was, again, using psilocybin-assisted therapy. Um, this was a single session of psilocybin-assisted therapy that was, was, again, supplemented by other psychotherapy. And the clinically significant response percentages for that study after one week, 67% of the enrollees uh, reported that clinically significant response had been shown. And after four weeks, 71%. And those who met the remission criteria was charted around 58% at one week and 54% at four weeks. So again, my special interests, my knowledges are anchored and oriented around the intersection of psychedelics and autism primarily. So I will leave the experts in depression and psilocybin research to explain the rest of that there. I bring this into the slide deck simply to point out that there is some established efficacy with psilocybin and there is similarly an established need within the autistic community 
autistic populations for treatment options, which again goes back to the sort of cognitive liberty and inclusivity component of the importance of autistics being um, considered for some of these uh, therapies, which begin as perhaps seen as you know somewhat of experimental, uh, again working with healthy healthy normals, but to create a window of opportunity. Um, again, and hopefully these sort of subjective accounts can leverage uh, uh, the importance uh, of some of these therapy options um, ongoing over time. So I've said it in a number of ways already, but <laughs> probably just said it, but the prevalence of depression in autistics shown to be correlated with the alexithymia factor warrants further investigation into psychedelic assisted therapeutic options for autistics, especially options already revealed as efficacious in healthy normal populations. So that's depression, alexithymia, and acceptance. And so I believe that takes us to connection which is supposed to be number four, but hey, it's number three. So connection, why might connection matter? It's fairly straightforward, I understand, but so adults with ASD uh, who are social isolated, and this is uh, a book chapter that was related to loneliness and social isolation in, in uh, children and in adults. Um, again, it's fairly straightforward to understand the impacts of isolation. It's also worth noting that isolation of an intentional choice is also important to autistics who might be recharging, um, you know, recovering from a sort of uh, self-perceived overwhelm or uh, meltdown, whichever language might be assigned. But either way, uh, in this particular um in this particular piece, they explain that adults with ASD who were socially isolated, meaning that there was a lack of opportunities to be social and maintain those social relationships, were found to have poor outcomes such as loneliness and decreased social functioning. Social isolation is highest among individuals with ASD compared to other disability groups. And again, I am borrowing these full block quotes from these pieces of literature. I invite you to read further about them. Um, and I also feel compelled as well to uh, acknowledge that uh, other disability groups uh, are still, anyone facing depression or isolation issues is still just as important regardless of population numbers. They are, they matter, they are valid. Um, so the basic idea being that psychedelics can engender both personal and interpersonal connection and alleviate potentially predominant experience of that autistic isolation which again is not all autistics there's extroverted autistics believe it or not um, and a lot of these behavior patterns are encoded based on what we touched on at the very beginning of the definitions piece of autism manifesting as a result of some of these sensory intensities or hypo intensities and therefore someone might be an introvert that very much enjoys uh, exchanging chat-based information with other individuals or who very much enjoys playing sports with large groups of people or dancing, any of these things. And it all depends on like what particular skill set is being impacted by some of these sensory issues. So it's not as simple as like these stereotypes we've come to know. And that's like almost like the disappointing part of this whole thing is that like, what is an autist an autistic person is, is a human they're just a human and they have some trends and traits that we use based on the medicalization models but at the end of the day it's just an invitation to get to know those individuals anyhow i'm on my soapbox so i'll take pause so a quote from grace age 30 uh, diagnosed with asperger's and this was again in relation to one of her psychedelic experiences she said I still remember this sense of connection between me and the beings, human and non-humans, that are all around me. I also know it's possible to feel as though I am a part of a community. I feel much less anxious in my social surroundings thanks to that feeling. And another quote from Victor, who is an autistic adult, he said, Psychedelics proved remarkably efficient in amending my psychological impairments. I gained the ability to feel things which I very seldom had felt before. 
extending beyond the duration of the experiences themselves and manifesting as long-term changes to my emotional processing. I was suddenly able to truly sense love and affection and also able to form genuine bonds with people and understand interaction, human interaction as a whole. And lastly, this is a quote from Jay, an autistic adult, and I introduced this quote because, it, again, it colors in something that's quite important. I'll explain that in a moment here. But many people share that they feel more connected with others after taking these substances. For me, the opposite has been true. In the early years of my life, I passed as neurotypical and, while introverted and easily overwhelmed, had a fairly typical relationship pattern. After using psychedelics, I became more acutely aware of my neurodiversity. I have become increasingly selective when it comes to friendships. Unless I feel a genuine intellectual and energetic connection with someone, I would rather spend time alone. So again, this speaks to reassigning agency to a neurodivergent individual uh, and the importance of that cannot be understated. So although we might have these targets of increasing sociabilities, in the end, bringing the aspect of choice and awareness into those individuals so that they can navigate into and out of social spaces is just as important. So again, this person seemingly had an opposite outcome at the same point, they're experiencing a similar benefit of self-awareness, self-understanding, self-growth. So, in summary, why might psychedelics matter to autistics? Acceptance, in terms of engendering that acceptance. Alexithymia, in terms of alleviating or improving the state of that alexithymia and increasing that interoceptive processing. Depression, as in simply uh, being able to address depressive symptoms just as they would in healthy normal populations. And connection, being able to introduce uh, individuals uh, to a sense of both inner and uh, interpersonal uh, connection. And in other cases, connection far beyond to connections of nature, a sort of universality, things of that sort. So, we have now reached more or less the finish line of this thing, and uh, I want to just offer up a few ways to get involved if you would like, um, and uh, then from there, we'll close out and you guys can uh, get to questions. So, first, you can join us for a 90-minute open Zoom discussion. Uh, we are presently offering these Zoom discussions every Thursday and Sunday. And the RSVP and Zoom links are hosted through AutisticPsychedelic.com. These meetings are open to all neurotypes, so that includes neurotypical, non-neurotypical. That also includes caretakers. That also includes autistic individuals, people who've received a diagnosis. Like, Open to all narrow types could also be read as open to all humans. We just ask for a level of respect and uh, just knowing that the conversation is centered around neurodivergent voices. And we have a suggested donation for our meetings to keep all this work that we're doing going forward. You can also visit our website, which again is where you can locate the join links for the meetings. You can RSVP for future meetings. You can make a donation if you feel so inclined and you can also send us an email myself i'm here representing the autistic psychedelic community today i work in conjunction with justine lee uh, who is a pharmacology uh, grad student at the university of california irvine who's uh, looking into uh, psychedelic compounds with respect to their therapeutic potential in the context of autism and other neurological conditions so if you want to get in touch with us by all means do we are here and we would love to hear from you with any questions or interests you might have. Last but not least, you can also pre-order, or if you're watching this at some future point, you can just go ahead and order our book, and that's going to be available through autisticpsychedelic.com as well. 
and again the revenue earned on that uh, book is going to go towards perpetuating more of the kind of work that you've seen here tonight and inside the pages of that book and essentially you're supporting a really small core group of people that are looking to expand this out into something that can eventually hopefully provide equitable and affordable access to services of this sort uh, in the future so with that <laughs> i say thank you i really um it means a great deal that um, you've spent this much time uh, listening through all of this watching through all of this um, this exact slide deck that you're uh, coming to a close with with me all of this is, is really the culmination of maybe <laughs> like eight years of work on my part and a couple of years of work of collaboration between <laughs> hundreds maybe thousands of people uh, coming together to create these insights um, so that they could be presented here um, and I also remind us you know, I said you can send us an email, you can come to our meetings, whatever it is. It's just that this presentation is is not a declaration. This is, to me, as with anything that's happening all throughout this whole thing, it's the continuation of a conversation. And we're all here for that conversation. And we invite you into that conversation. Because we've just, by coming together in this group setting and, and sharing insights in this way, it's just like the smartest person in the room becomes like the whole room. And we would love for more people to be in that room to converse and to share um, and to grow together uh, towards more intelligent understandings of these things. I mean, autism and psychedelics, are, they're both stigmatized in various ways. They both, even when you say the word psychedelic, you would get a million answers to what is a psychedelic. Like, it has a narrow definition, but it's also being stretched in different directions. Similarly, autism as well. So hopefully by now you understand <laughs> why the autistic psychedelic community exists and why it might be important. And again, I just thank you with all my being for your time here today. And I'll just sign off there. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you.